Hello everyone! Today's video is a review of 1965's Frankenstein vs. Baragon, also known by its US title, Frankenstein Conquers the World. This Showa era Toho production was directed by Ishiro Honda, with special effects by Eiji Tsuburaya and music by Akira Ifukube. You know, the usual suspects. The film opens with a prologue set in Germany, 1945. As Allied forces invade, the Germans decide to transport a piece of precious cargo, the immortal heart of Frankenstein, to a Japanese sub waiting to receive it in the Pacific. At the Hiroshima Army Hospital, and according to my research that is the correct way to say it, Japanese scientists study the still-beating heart, and they're theorizing about how they can use it in the war when suddenly the atomic bomb is dropped and the hospital and all surrounding buildings are destroyed. Fifteen years later, at a new hospital in Hiroshima, we meet a couple of scientists, played by Nick Adams and Kumi Mizuno, who study the harmful effects the bombs have had on people. They encounter a wild boy who devours small animals and can't speak, and to shield him from the public, they take him in. But when his growth rapidly accelerates and he starts to exhibit superhuman strength, they begin to wonder if this boy is the new owner of the Heart of Frankenstein. Whew, this was a tricky one to summarize. I think because there's a lot you have to take for granted. Like, the entire premise. <laughs> uh, never mind the misnomer, that it's not Frankenstein's heart, it's the monster's heart, but this boy isn't a monster, and he's not a descendant of Frankenstein, so we should call him neither Frankenstein nor the new Frankenstein's monster, and you can't really call him Frankenstein's creature or creation because the mad scientist himself had nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's complicated. You also have to accept the blending of sober truth and total fiction. The war, the Axis powers, the A-bombs, that's all real and well-documented. Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. That's just a story. And yet these characters speak of Dr. Frankenstein as if he were a real person, really existed, his experiments really worked. And for me... I don't know. I can buy a lot of things, but for some reason, there was just something too ridiculous about that. I also could not explain to you how this whole thing with the heart is supposed to work. You just have to accept that somehow this heart never stops beating, and once it became irradiated, somehow it either got into an infant that was hanging around the hospital, or it formed the boy around itself. <laughs> I had a little trouble with this one, <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> it has some surprising elements, especially in the prologue. These films seldom allude to the war and its immediate aftermath, so I found this opening unusual and somewhat surreal. Besides some of the visuals being a bit off, I found myself wondering how this film's Japanese audience responded to the Germans. Did they view them as good or as bad? During the war they were allies, though then and now is acknowledged they made strange bedfellows. Ideologically as well as culturally, the two countries weren't really aligned, but in 1965, I wonder what was people's reaction to seeing the two working together? There's a scene when the Japanese sub is preparing to receive the unidentified package from the Nazis, and they speculate that the Germans may be sending them uh, some powerful new weapon, or it could even be Hitler. Uh, and they talk about the heart enabling them to make soldiers who won't die from gunshot wounds, who will be able to survive battle and go on fighting forever. This is a Japanese film, so I understand the attitude it takes toward Japan's stance in the war, the desire for their side to crush the Allies and um, be victorious over them. I get it. It's essentially the opposite of what you get in an Allied country's war movie, where the Japanese and the Germans are the enemy and the goal is Allied victory. I respect the opposing perspective and acknowledge that the film 
wasn't made for an American audience. It was an American, this film is an American co-production, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but it's primarily made for a Japanese audience. Um, that said, those scenes, and especially their implications, were a little jarring, and I couldn't help responding by mentally going down a certain track, um, having a certain debate in my mind, which I don't want to have here. <laughs> And that just wasn't something I was expecting. I did not go into the movie looking for controversy, and yet there it was. Interestingly, that scene was removed from the US version, as was a scene with a mutilated rabbit being found in a classroom, and some interactions between the film's leads. So if you've only ever seen the American edit, uh, you're probably thinking, what is she even talking about? But moving on to the rest of the movie, its concept is curious, um, and I have mixed feelings about the story and its execution. The protagonists are likable people engaged in good work at the hospital who do their best to understand this feral child they've come across. They have a charming personal dynamic and openly discuss their cultural differences, including American and Japanese senses of humor. It's quite a somber film overall, so it's nice to have moments of levity like this and show the two cultures living side by side and seeking to understand each other. We've got a lot of Godzilla series alumni here. Dr. Bowen is played by American actor Nick Adams, who spoke his lines in English and then was dubbed for the Japanese audio track. I've said it before about other films that feature English-speaking actors. It's too bad there wasn't a hybrid audio track option so that all the actors could speak their own lines and subtitles would appear when necessary. As it is, you only get half of Adams' performance, while in the American version, you only get half of the Japanese actor's performances. Adams did dub his own lines in the American cut, though, so at least there's that. Frequent kaiju co-star and fan favorite Kumi Mizuno plays his assistant Dr. Togami, wearing some very chic, colorful outfits. Later that year, Mizuno and Adams starred together in Invasion of Astro Monster with the great Akira Takarada. If I may pause to say a word about him, Akira Takarada, one of my favorite actors in the Godzilla series, passed away this March at the age of 87. He was one of the last surviving cast members of the original 1954 Godzilla and played many wonderful characters in other kaiju entries. Even if the films themselves at times weren't great, he made them better just by being in them. He was gracious to his fans and good-natured about the franchise, and he is missed. Speaking of alumni from the first Godzilla film, I was pleasantly surprised to see a cameo appearance from Takashi Shimura as the doctor who examines the Frankenstein heart. And there's a host of other familiar faces, including, but not limited to, Yoshio Tsuchiya, Jun Suzaki, and Yoshifumi Tajima, who were also in Invasion of Astro Monster. Credited as Frankenstein is Koji Furuhata, wearing prosthetics and colored contacts. He had a modest career, just five acting credits between 1962 and 2017. That's more than the actor who portrayed young Frankenstein, Sumio Nakao, credited as Kinichiro Kawaji. He only appeared in one other film. This version of He's credited as Frankenstein, so we'll just call him Frankenstein. <laughs> this version of Frankenstein is an infantile, sympathetic figure, as afraid of people as they are of him, helpless about his own state, and deserving of compassion. He thrives in response to kindness, but his behavior is unpredictable. His ignorance of his brute strength makes him dangerous. He's not violent, but they end up keeping him in a cage as a precaution, and it's considered safe to approach him as long as Dr. Togami is there. Their relationship reflects King Kong's connection with Andero. All that said, I feel sorry for him, I guess I root for him in the fight, but I never really warm up to him. I think what puts me off the most are the bright red, bloody-looking gums we see whenever he bares his teeth. 
It's also puzzling that they describe him as a white boy with strange blue eyes. Was he supposed to look German? Because he doesn't. Once on his own, he heads up to the Japanese Alps because apparently the colder climate reminds him of Frankfurt, where he never lived, but uh, his heart did. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of trouble with this whole heart thing, that whole aspect of the movie. It's also humorous that a lot of their Frankenstein monster lore stems not from the book, but from what happened in the old Universal films. They explain that the monster seemed to die many times, but his heart never stopped beating, so he always came back. But that wasn't intended to be part of the character. That was just the studio saying, Hey, this movie did pretty well. I know we made it seem like we killed the big guy once and for all at the end, but let's resurrect him in some new outlandish way for another movie. The film tries to legitimize this with some talk about the high protein supply allowing cells to heal and regenerate. Thus, they figure out a way to identify whether the boy is the real deal or not. If they chop off his arm and his leg, and he grows new ones, he must be Frankenstein. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why do they have to be so drastic? Why do they have to take both his arm and his leg? Why not one or the other? Or, or even better than that, just, I don't know, take off, take off one of his little toes or, or his pinky finger or something. Why do you have to lop off, like, the two appendages on this side or that side? Why? Or are they gonna do, like, this arm and that leg? I mean, it just sounds so cruel, because what if he isn't Frankenstein? Are you gonna, like, just stitch it back on? I don't think so. <laughs> This is nuts, but it does lead to some good debate about whether or not he's human, and even if he isn't, if that means he should be treated any less humanely. As for his chief opponent, this marks Baragon's first film appearance, with none other than Haruo Nakajima in the suit taking a break from playing Godzilla. Baragon also appeared briefly in 1968's Kaiju Smorgasbord Destroy All Monsters, and in 2001's Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah Giant Monsters All Out Attack, and is not to be confused with Gamera's opponent in 1966's Gamera vs. Baragon. I've reviewed all of those movies, by the way. Baragon's design includes a horn, which sometimes glows, floppy ears, petal-shaped ridges on his back, and an ability to burrow underground and cause earthquakes and landslides. His chief weapon is the ability to cast a flame ray, which he does in his fight with Frankenstein, but oddly enough, this Frankenstein's monster, unlike most of his predecessors, does not appear to be afraid of fire. The film does have its hilarious moments, of course, just as I anticipated, like the disembodied hand moving independently, and how excited they get about it. I like to think about someone sewing Frankenstein a giant button-down shirt and pants, and I had to laugh at this shot of Baragon with chicken feathers flying out of his mouth, followed by this glimpse of a comically fake horse. I gotta say, though, these moments make for a strange contrast with earlier scenes of the war, the bomb, and innocent children dying. Um, I find myself thinking of this as two movies, the scientific part with the grim and tragic realities, and the other part with the kid in the loincloth wrestling the giant rubber monster. It's a bit hard to reconcile the two, with the unfortunate consequence that the absurd nature of some scenes overrides what the film may have been trying to say in other scenes. I've seen that with other films that sought to address a serious problem, 1969's Gamera vs. Giron, for instance. Um, when I reviewed it a couple months ago, uh, people made a few jokes about Akio's obsession with traffic accidents. I hadn't noticed any such obsession, but uh, he does make a couple comments about traffic accidents. Recently, I heard an explanation for some of his dialogue. Car accidents were a growing concern in Japan as an increase in vehicles on the road, reckless driving, and traffic violations led to a spike in pedestrian fatalities, especially among the young and the elderly. 
this problem was most prevalent at the time of the film's release and was a very real uh, worry for parents. And that's why you often see children at that time wearing bright yellow baseball caps. It was a national campaign to ensure visibility and try to save their lives. Uh, in a similar vein, that same year, 1969, All Monsters Attack, or Godzilla's Revenge, came out and addressed another consequence of Japan's industrial boom, latchkey kids. Um, the film's protagonist is a boy whose parents are away working all the time, so he's left pretty much on his own. He has to look after himself and solve his own problems. As annoying as he is, it's a sad consequence, and it's no wonder he escapes into a fantasy world and the monster talks to him. I don't fault anyone for taking these films at face value. I did that, certainly with All Monsters Attack, um, and I heard about it in the comments. I got some comments from people who... Um, explained the historical context to me, the cultural context, and um, how that was meaningful to them. It didn't make me like the movie better, but it gave me a clearer understanding of what it was trying to say, why it was the way it was, and um, I felt a greater appreciation for it. Unfortunately, that's kind of gone by the wayside. Um, it's easy to get distracted by the silliness and completely miss the bigger picture, which changes the nature of the film. Anyway, Frankenstein vs. Baragon is more direct with its grave subject matter and somber tone, so it's harder to miss, and the bombastic parts never quite reach the zenith of insanity, but it still ends up being an odd mishmash of serious concepts and humorous visuals. I'd rather it had been either more serious or more intentionally fun, not somewhere in the middle. As it is, some segments feel prolonged, especially the lengthy period in which they're just searching for the giant boy. And then the last part revolves around the titular fight, and I was okay with the idea of it, especially when Frankenstein becomes the hero, showing up to rescue his human friends. But despite his growth spurt, he still appears significantly smaller than his opponent, and Baragon, who at times is too cute to be menacing, isn't a very creative fighter, so their big face-off struck me as kind of dull. We do get a couple fantastic moments like these, though, and as absurd as it is, it is exciting to get this rare look at a humanoid in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a kaiju. The film has an inconclusive ending, leading characters to speculate about Frankenstein's survival and his future. As it turns out, there was an alternate ending filmed just for the US release, in which Frankenstein defeats Baragon, only to be confronted by a giant octopus that ends up dragging him into the water. This last battle was added at the request of American co-producer Henry G. Saperstein, who had enjoyed a similar fight in King Kong vs. Godzilla. But ultimately, the original ending prevailed, and the early U.S. title, Frankenstein vs. the Giant Devilfish, was scrapped. This movie's production history is almost as dizzying as its plot, and goes all the way back to King Kong special effects whiz Willis O'Brien. O'Brien wanted to make a King Kong meets Frankenstein film. That idea was stolen from him and sold to Toho in 1962 as King Kong vs. Prometheus. Toho had already been interested in incorporating Frankenstein's monster in a potential sequel to the 1960 film The Human Vapor. When that project got axed, they turned to this King Kong vs. Prometheus idea, but they swapped out Frankenstein for their own creation and made King Kong vs. Godzilla instead. As a follow-up, they considered bringing Frankenstein in to fight Godzilla, but that project was axed and they made Mothra vs. Godzilla instead. However, a couple years later, with financial backing from American producer Henry G. Saperstein's company, that concept was revisited, Godzilla replaced by Baragon. 
This was the first of three U.S.-Japanese co-productions they made with Henry G. Saperstein Enterprises, later United Productions of America, or UPA, with whom Toho signed a distribution contract. UPA later became instrumental in introducing American audiences to Japanese kaiju and tokusatsu films through theatrical releases and TV syndication. While on the production side, they followed up this film with Invasion of Astro Monster, also in 1965, and The War of the Gargantuas in 1966. The War of the Gargantuas is a loose sequel to Frankenstein vs. Baragon, featuring two giants that are supposed to be Frankenstein's offspring. I haven't watched that one yet, though, so I can't say any more about it. And I think I've said pretty much all I have to say about this film, so I'll wrap it up here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've seen the film, please go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comments below. I know this one's got a loyal following, so I look forward to all of your responses, and I'll be back next week. Thanks for watching!